The sixth lecture, MRI Imperfections, Part 2, is broken down into three parts, and Lecture 6b covers motion compensation. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to list several methods for managing patient motion, explain how synchronization between imaging and physiology can limit imaging errors, appreciate that MRI signals are complex valued, list several sources of phase in complex MR signals, describe the relationship between motion, phase, and gradients, and finally to understand how flow compensated gradient waveforms limit motion-induced signal phase from moving spins. When it comes to motion management, there's always several approaches which we can use individually or of course in combination. We can think about better ways to manage the patient or synchronize imaging to the patient's physiology. We can think about specific acquisition methods that might limit motion artifacts. And we can also consider reconstruction methods that could limit motion artifacts. When it comes to uh, motion management and the patient perspective, there are several things that come into play. We can consider breath holding, which we discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, this requires fast sequences that can be acquired during a reasonable period of respiratory suspension. So that can be a challenge for that approach. We can also consider things like respiratory gating and ECG gating. These may ultimately increase the scan time, uh, but at the same time uh, produce images that are, uh, have less uh, artifacts as, uh, that arise from respiratory or cardiac motion. This can have some constraints on the underlying TR as well. And in sequences where the TR is not constant, that can actually produce image artifacts. We can also consider patient coaching uh, and some mild degree of patient or physical constraint. You can see this on the right-hand side where the tech is helping the patient get positioned on the table, placing a coil over the chest, and in fact using some straps that hold both the patient and the coil uh, relatively still. There could be concerns here with uh, patient acceptance and perhaps with discomfort, but overall this is a pretty widely accepted approach. So what about managing cardiac motion in particular, which seems to be, uh, could be especially challenging? The approach we take to this is to synchronize through the patient's specific EKG signal, the electrocardiogram. We can place ECG patches on their chest and use that uh, to monitor their uh, cardiac rhythm. The ECG uh, can be detected, this is the QRS complex, can be detected, and that can initiate a triggering event which tells the scanner to begin scanning. And we may, for example, begin to scan in the middle of case space and specifically only acquire a so-called segment of case space. A segment of case space is a collection of several adjacent lines. This might be four lines or eight lines or 12 lines, but it's essentially a block or segment of case space. And overall, this approach is called the segmented case space imaging approach. Now, the temporal footprint of that segment is equal to the TR, the time it takes to acquire a single echo, multiplied by the number of KY lines in that segment. So if the TR is eight milliseconds and our uh, number of lines in the segment is six, then this would have about a 48 millisecond temporal footprint. Now, of course, if we only acquire a very small number of lines, then we can only re uh, recover an image of the underlying object with relatively low spatial frequency information or low spatial resolution. The next step in this imaging process, however, is to repeat acquisition of that identical segment, the same lines of case space, filling different case space uh, frames, if you will. And we can repeat the acquisition of this segment many, many times uh, until the end of the first cardiac cycle, for example. And as a consequence, we'll have a very low resolution image of the heart, but at multiple cardiac phases. And this could be done, for example, in a single heartbeat. Now, owing to the periodicity of the cardiac cycle, we can do something clever which is in the subsequent heartbeat, that is the second heartbeat, we can acquire another different segment of case space, which is adding spatial frequency information relative to the previously acquired case space data. And as a consequence of filling a little bit more of case space, our images have sharpened up slightly while also allowing us to, uh, to image or capture the dynamics of the cardiac cycle. And so you can imagine this process continuing through a series of many heartbeats. It could be six heartbeats, 10 heartbeats, or as long as the patient can comfortably hold their breath, and all the while acquiring more and more spatial frequency information so that finally we have a temporal series of images uh, that represent a composite of that patient's uh, cardiac motion during several uh, cardiac cycles.
There's other approaches to motion management. Uh, there are reconstruction approaches and combinations of uh, acquisition and reconstruction methods. So we can think about undersampling the data using partial Fourier methods, parallel imaging methods, or even pushing the limits of fast imaging to acquire so-called real-time images, an example of which we see here on the right-hand side. We can also use so-called motion compensation techniques and use 1D or 3D uh, uh, motion estimates from so-called navigator echoes. And this is an example of a so-called navigator echo. It's a one-dimensional signal that's acquired, say, uh, through the dome of the left liver lobe, uh, sorry, the right liver lobe. Uh, and it gives us a very uh, high contrast signal from which we could track respiratory motion. And so this interface here of the lung and the liver is giving us a good indication of the respiratory state for the subject. This can be done very quickly and it can be integrated into uh, the data acquisition and reconstruction scheme so that we're keeping data during relevant periods of the respiratory cycle and throwing out other data. Or we can think about actual correction methods where we try to use all this information and build in a motion model. So when it comes to motion management, there's a lot of different approaches that we can consider. Uh, at the acquisition end of the spectrum, we've talked some about swapping the phase and frequency encode direction, especially in the previous lecture, to limit motion artifacts. We could also use multiple averages. There's other approaches that we could think about. The one that I want to describe mostly today is so-called flow compensated gradient waveforms. So a very pulse sequence oriented approach to limiting motion artifacts. Okay, so a quick uh, quiz. You can pause the slide after you've read this if you want, and then I'll discuss the answer. Which of the following is not associated with reducing artifacts? Is it segmented case-based imaging? Is it transient suspension of respiration? Is it swapping the phase and frequency directions? Or is it lowering the imaging flip angle? Now, most of these things we've talked about, so in some ways that's a giveaway, but we don't expect that lowering the imaging flip angle will have a significant uh, impact on uh, imaging artifacts per se. But we know that if we segment case space and synchronize to the cardiac cycle, that that's helpful. Certainly, if we can suspend respiration, we can mitigate respiratory motion-induced artifacts. And sometimes swapping the phase and frequency encoding directions can uh, reduce the artifacts uh, substantially. So a really important thing to remember uh, about uh, MR signals, and something we haven't discussed in detail uh, in the course uh, to date, is that the MR signals that we acquire are complex valued. And there's different ways to sort of think about this, but fundamentally, the transverse magnetization is a function of many things. It's a function of, of space, thereby uh, we can create images. It can be a function of the proton density, the T1, the T2, and in fact, many other factors, uh, which in part underlies the, the, the great value of MR. This magnitude, or this signal that's written on the right-hand side, however, is really the composition of both a magnitude signal, which is really the conventional signal that we look at with imaging. We look at the absolute value of the acquired imaging data or the magnitude of the acquired imaging data, but it's always comes with a complex phase as well. And this phase is, is inherent to the underlying data for a number of different reasons. We know that uh, on Fourier transform uh, and through the signal equation that we can capture a state of the transverse magnetization to produce an image. And consequently, the images themselves are complex valued as well. So not just the transverse magnetization, but the image itself that we uh, um, reconstruct as complex value. And so conventionally, or more conventionally, we look at the magnitude images, and here's an example of a magnitude image uh, taken during the uh, cardiac cycle towards the base of the heart. But we can actually reconstruct a phase image, and the phase image can actually store really useful and important information. We won't talk about encoding information in the phase in this lecture, uh, but, uh, but we'll begin to build up some math mathematical tools that are useful for understanding how to encode information in the phase. So interestingly, the phase in our, in our complex valued signals comes from many things. We can have the phase from chemical shift effects, we can have phase from susceptibility, and we can have phase from uh, field inhomogeneity. There are different ways to minimize the effects of chemical shift, and in general, susceptibility and inhomogeneity effects can be corrected in, in a variety of ways. And generally, we would refer to these as off-resonance effects. Sometimes off-resonance effects also includes uh, chemical shift effects. We learned in the previous lectures, lectures some about Maxwell terms, which we know can be corrected, 
and eddy currents, which can be mitigated in a variety of different ways, either using enge engineering approaches, pulse sequence approaches, or reconstruction approaches. Interestingly, uh, the phase of the transverse magnetization signal can also be affected by the applied gradient moments. And that's a concept that's relatively familiar already because we use gradients to induce phase during phase encoding. Um, but motion artifacts uh, can also arise through the product of the encoding gradients uh, and, the, and the position history of the spin system. So this motion phase can lead to motion artifacts, or in fact, it can actually allow us to encode motion. In this lecture, we'll talk mostly about motion artifacts and how to mitigate them. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how to encode. So at the end of the day, if we can minimize and or correct most of these sources of off resonance, um, then the total phase may just be the, pro, uh, the sum rather of the off resonance phase and the motion induced phase. And there are a variety of methods, we'll talk more about these in the next lecture, where we can estimate the off resonance phase and thereby only be left with a motion component to the phase. And that hints at how we might be able to do quantitative imaging uh, by encoding motion information in the phase of the complex magnetization. So we know that phase arises from the gradient according to the following equation. This is just uh, phi sub g. Uh, it's going to have the amount of phase uh, that will accrue depends on the spatial position and the time, where the time is really uh, time during the application of a gradient waveform. So we have some gradient waveform that's on and then off. It has some function of time. And the amount of phase that we will accrue depends on the magnetic field gradient's amplitude, the spatial position relative to isocenter, and then we have to integrate this over time because the longer the gradient is on, or the stronger the gradient, the more phase will accrue. And of course, this becomes a phase uh, through a multiplication with the gyromagnetic ratio. So here we have a relatively weak gradient. And if we integrate this uh, waveform as a function of time, then we're going to accrue uh, phase relatively slowly. On the other hand, if we use stronger and longer gradients, then that's going to produce more phase more quickly. And so we have a steeper accrual of phase, and because it's on for longer, of course, we're accruing uh, uh, even greater amounts of phase. Now, interestingly, the spin's position history can be expanded through a Taylor series. And so we think of this, this vector uh, expression here as being the position vector as a function of time, and that depends on the initial position of the spin, but it also depends on the initial velocity of the spin and the initial acceleration of the spin. Uh, and then, of course, as a function of time. So this is a generalized expression for a spin's position history. So we can use that in the phase equation that we just developed to show that the phase arising from a gradient depends on the gradient waveform dotted with the initial position, the velocity times time, some acceleration terms, and in fact, even higher order terms. But it turns out for the most part in MR, these higher order terms are quite small and can be ignored and they're left for a, a topic uh, for a different lecture. So we can consider, for example, 2D through plane velocity sensitivity. And how would we achieve velocity sensitivity? Well, we know the phase of our acquired signal is going to have some off resonance phase. And now we've just learned that it's going to have some position encoding uh, information, but also some velocity encoding information owing to this dependence on the initial velocity uh, during the interval of encoding and imaging. There's an expression here that we've substituted in, which is just called the zeroth moment, the integral uh, of, the, of the gradient waveform. This is the so-called zeroth moment. And we also have a first moment, where the first moment is only different in that we multiply by time. And there are so-called second and third order moments, which account for things like acceleration terms and higher order moments. So by substitution of these two expressions here, we get a more compact uh, phase rep phase expression uh, shown in the middle, wherein we see the conventional position encoding, which is useful for identifying the location of a spin for imaging, uh, but we also have a phase component which accords with the underlying velocity. And that's uh, potentially a problem in that it's adding phase to our underlying signal. And if we add too much phase, or if we actually have intravoxel distribution of phase, that will lead to a signal attenuation and a signal artifact. So mathematically, we might identify that if were we able to eliminate this term, it would no longer contribute to the phase. And mathematically, the only way to eliminate this term in general is by designing gradient waveforms whose first moment is zero, 
So if this is always zero, then this term can't contribute to the underlying signal phase. That's a really clever sort of insight uh, to how we can manipulate or manage the phase in MR sequences. So let's look at what happens in a so-called flow compensated gradient waveform. So a flow compensated gradient waveform is one for which the first moment, M1, is equal to zero. And we also uh, have chosen to use a gradient who has, that has no net zero moment either. And this ends up being a very typical gradient waveform that gets used in MR sequences a lot. We'll see it in just a second. So orienting you, I'm going to turn on a gradient as a function of time. But what we're looking at on the left-hand side here is the effective B field as a function of space. When we turn on gradients, we uh, induce a, a spatial linear distribution of magnetic field uh, change. And that, of course, will impact the underlying spin phase at different positions. And so we have two examples we're going to look at, stationary tissues and flowing blood signals. So let's look what happens when we turn on our gradient. We're going to cause spins at different positions to accrue different amounts of phase. The gradient is constant in amplitude, as you see in this gradient waveform here. But the amount of accrued phase is linearly dependent on how far away you are from isocenter. And so in the rotating frame, some spins have gone counterclockwise, and they go more so counterclockwise the more distant you are from isocenter. And on the other side, they're, of course, going clockwise, more so as you get increasingly distant from isocenter. And so we see that there can be some phase accumulation as a function of time. Now, interestingly, for the spin that was moving, as it was moving through a magnetic field gradient, it was initially accruing a high amount of phase, but as it moved towards isocenter, it tapered off and began to accrue less phase. So it has a quadratic dependence. When we flip the gradient over to be twice as high for the same period of time, we actually accrue uh, an equal and opposite, or sorry, uh, we, we accrue twice as much uh, opposite phase. So if we show this one more time, Here's the phase accruing with the first lobe of the gradient, and now the phase is accruing in the opposite handedness for the second phase of the gradient. And this flowing spin, of course, is on a different magnetic field trajectory, so it accumulates a different amount of phase. Now watch what happens in this very last part, which is the kind of remarkable bit. So we're going to turn on a third gradient here, and we're going to try to restore the signal phase. And I'll show that you can restore the signal phase for stationary tissues as well as flowing blood, regardless of the underlying velocity. And so while this is only shown uh, sort of by cartoon example here, you can see that the stationary tissues have all lined up to have a uniform and identical phase. But in fact, this blood flowing spin also has the same result. It also has returned to have zero phase. And that's a consequence of the specific design of this gradient waveform which mathematically uh, we can show has no first, uh, sorry, no zeroth moment, but it also has no first moment. So regardless of the, of the velocity of the spin that's flowing through this vessel, if you will, it will not be able to accrue any, any um, net phase so long as the velocity is constant during the interval of observation. And so in this sense, the phase for this so-called flow compensated experiment is the off resonance phase plus gamma times the zeroth moment times the initial position plus the first moment dotted with the velocity plus, for example, the acceleration terms. Uh, but because this is a zero and first moment uh, nulled gradient waveform, a lot of these terms drop out. So we can get rid of those terms. And we already said that the acceleration is not of concern to us. And so this particular pulse sequence will not have sensitivity to, uh, or this particular gradient waveform won't be sensitive to position, velocity, or acceleration. And consequently, it allows us to actually directly estimate the off-resonance phase all by itself. So in a spoiled gradient echo uh, sequence, we might consider or might want to flow compensate this gradient waveform. And so just to orient uh, you, this is the RF pulse that's used for slice selection. That's followed by phase encoding and then a readout prephaser and the readout gradient, which helps form uh, the echo, which uh, stores imaging information for us that we record to K-space. At the end of uh, recording the data, we might spoil so that there's no magnetization carrying over to the next uh, uh, excitation event. And then, of course, we might excite again to start the next TR. This is not a flow compensated uh, gradient sequence. And so if you look at the, the shape of the gradient that we showed in the previous slides, uh, we don't identify any of these gradients having that particular shape. 
but we can make these waveforms uh, to be uh, M1 compensated or M0 compensated or whatever we like. Uh, I won't get into the mathematics of how we calculate those things, but it's, it's relatively straightforward. So in this case, if we wanted to flow compensate, uh, we would uh, say on the through plane direction, so just on the, uh, on, the, on the slicing code direction, we'd have to add an additional gradient lobe here. And this additional gradient lobe would mean that from the, from the time of peak excitation here to the time of the echo here, uh, that we would be flow compensated. So you could sort of picture this gradient area being A, this is actually 2A, and this would be A again. Now this is actually a terrible time to play a gradient because it of course overlaps with the readout gradients and our attempt to form an echo. And so in principle, we have to make a little bit of space here because that's going to clobber our echo. And so we have to stretch things out a little bit if we want this particular waveform to be flow compensated. And now by stretching things out, we can move the readout downstream, we can move the echo downstream, it no longer collides uh, with this uh, intermediate size gradient that would obviously uh, destroy our echo signal. And so this is a way to flow compensate, particularly in the, in the Z direction. Uh, and that will mean that flowing spins won't, won't uh, end up with any additional phase. Uh, and remember, additional phase to your signal could lead to flow artifacts or signal voids, uh, depending on the degree and distribution of phase within the voxel. Okay, so let's look at an example here. So here uh, we're talking about using flow compensated gradient waveforms uh, to, to limit or mitigate CSF flow artifacts. Uh, in general, the combination of flow and an uncompensated gradient leads to intravoxel dephasing. And so if the spins are moving at different velocities because of this, in this case of CSF flow, they'll accrue different amounts of phase. And if you have different amounts of phase within a voxel, that leads to signal attenuation. And so without flow compensation, you can see these sort of signal voids, which diagnostically could be concerning if you didn't know what the origin of the, of the signal void was. When we turn on flow compensation, for example, you can see that the signal levels return uh, to near normal. And this is just another example of seeing the same thing, where the motion artifacts are substantially mitigated with a flow compensated gradient waveform, and then just showing something similar uh, in a different view. So it's a very useful thing to include so-called flow compensation in your gradient waveform design, the downside being that it will extend the TE and the TR of your sequence. Here's one last interesting example that'll hint at um, how we might use uh, the phase information for encoding velocity. So here I'm showing a magnitude image. This is again a cardiac image, uh, and you see some fluctuations in signal intensities and overall um, uh, sort of differences in tissue contrast. On the right-hand side, I'm showing the phase image, again, for a flow-compensated sequence. This flow-compensated sequence is insensitive to underlying uh, flowing uh, velocities. And so you'll see that the phase in each of these territories here, which uh, I can identify for you as being regions of blood vessels or regions we expect to be uh, high velocity, we don't see any inherent uh, phase distribution here uh, that looks especially interesting, meaning the phase is pretty flat. And in this case, by sequence design, because the first moment is zero, we expect that the phase of the, the flow compensated phase will really just be the off resonance phase. And that's, that's generally what we, hear, what we see here. We, you'll notice that there is some additional phase for things that have chemical shift as well. So this is subcutaneous fat that accrues an additional uh, and relatively constant phase. So this is really an interesting example, only in that it shows that the phase can be made relatively constant within regions of high uh, flowing uh, velocities. Uh, and we'll show in one of the next lectures how we can actually turn this around to use it to sensitize to velocities and measure velocities. So one last uh, quiz question. You can pause this and, and read it for yourself, and then I'll discuss the answer. So here we're asking about uh, flow compensating a gradient waveform. Uh, does it mean that it's designed for M1 to be zero? Yes, it does. Does it extend uh, the duration of the gradient waveform by roughly 10%? Indeed it does, could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more. Does it limit flow artifacts in the images? It sure does. Uh, and do we generally ignore the acceleration effects? Indeed we do. Uh, it's not uh, terribly complicated to account for them, uh, but uh, the higher order terms uh, don't generally uh, contribute as much as the velocity terms. So in fact, the answer would be all of the above. So in summary, we discussed several methods to manage patient motion. Uh, 
We learned about synchronizing the imaging to physiological uh, signals. Uh, we learned or we know now that the MRI signals are complex valued and that several factors contribute to the MRI signal phase. We described the connection between motion, phase, and gradients. And we tried to link this both to how uh, phase can uh, be corrupted uh, and lead to motion artifacts, but also how it might be utilized, something we'll touch on more so in the next lecture. And we learned that flow compensated gradient waveforms can eliminate motion induced signal phase for moving spins. We saw that both in the cartoon example and then the in vivo example as well. So now you might be wondering if we can manage motion uh, so well, can we also measure it? And of course the answer is yes. And for that, you can turn to the next lecture. These again are two terrific texts, I think that uh, provide a lot of insight to the topic that was discussed today. So I encourage you to check them out. Thank you for joining us for RAD229 and look forward to uh, sharing with you the next lecture shortly.